I am covering the greatest biopic ever made, directed by one George Lucas. Yes, I am covering Raging Bull. This is the amazing movie he made before he got famous on the Star Wars trilogy. And it starred Lando Calrissian. Yes, the guy who played Lando Calrissian, Billy D. Williams, played an amazing part as a bullfighter. Yes, a bullfighter, but he's not a very good bullfighter, just like Kenny's not a very good stand-up comedian. Yes, he is the greatest. I, I just can't say how amazing he is. He saves uh, Vatican City. Long before Tom Hanks did, he saved Vatican City. Yes, and Batman makes an appearance in this movie. Batman rides on a mechanical bull for about 25 minutes, and it is absolutely amazing. One word that I would use to describe Kyle Sorelli would be friendship. Unbelievable. Driven. Gracious. I would say his optimism, loyal. Loving and caring. His sense of humor. Happy. Unshakable. It's unifier. Tough. I guess it would be special. Amazing. Amazing. Creative visionary. Inspirational, amazing young man. Sick and twisted? Yeah, sick. <laughs> I mean, strength. It's, 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 as weak as his body actually was, he was the strongest person that I know. On August 16th, 1983, Annette and Vincent Sorelli welcomed a beautiful baby boy into this world. Little Kyle had made his grand entrance. As a child, Kyle could engage with anyone and instantly put a smile on their face. Uh, things were pretty normal. Uh, taking him to different sporting events or taking him with us everywhere, changing his diapers when he was very small, and just uh, things were, were pretty normal. Uh, when he was here, uh, just a happy-go-lucky kid, uh, always had a lot of energy, you know, was a typical kid. He listened to what you had to say, but he always had his own opinion about things. He always, at three years old, at four years old, at five years old, he was very independent, even when he was young. Well, he was our first child, my husband and I always say. Often he would come and just spend weekends with us at our house. And I watched him grow from a little boy to a young man to a full-grown adult. He loved the water. Loved the water. He used to, you know, swim like a fish. I, I remember his mother saying, all right, dinner's ready. And us going, running down the hallway together, racing each other to get to the table first because we wanted the, the cool seat at the end of the table. I mean, when I was younger, me, him, and my brother were very close, and we'd literally go to the zoo. We'd go to the zoo and hang out, and then we'd sleep over, and we'd play like X-Men cards or magic or something goofy like that. And then I actually pretty much grew up with Kyle like since I was like first born. Um, so my first memory of Kyle was actually going to Disney World uh, when I was about five, and uh, I would ride his chair all around, and so that I wouldn't have to walk. And then from there on, I kind of just like stuck with them and that was it. At around age six, Kyle was diagnosed with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, but that did not slow him down one bit. Shortly after this diagnosis, Kyle and his family began working with the Muscular Dystrophy Association, searching for a positive message in all this. Kyle was selected to work as an ambassador for MDA serving as the poster child for two years. Kyle's parents will tell you that this really was the first sign that Kyle was something truly special. As MDA was involved in the community, they asked us to, to attend these many events, and boy, Kyle just ate that right up from an early age. He, you could tell he, he loved to engage with people. He loved the fact that we were going around. He, he was real ham. That became kind of a sign or a turning point or something we started to realize that Kyle really was a kind of a an actor a uh, you know he engaged people he loved to be around people and, and that always uh, that 
seemed to follow him or, or be building from that point on with him as he grew older. I don't think anybody ever noticed the wheelchair. It was always Kyle. His smile, his talking, conversation, things like that. So I think, you know, he, he did well. Kyle went from walking to being wheelchair bound and never a complaint, never. He just kind of went with the flow of things. When he was sicker in the hospital and go and visit him, he was just never sad. He was always happy, always smiling and always talking about film and movies and what he was working on and what he was, what he, what he was doing, but never about why he was, he, he was there. You know, he knew he had a condition, right? And I think that that's where his strength came from. It never dampened what he wanted to do and who he wanted to be. Never. It never did. Back when, like, Guitar Hero was, like, the thing to play, um, you basically had to use both hands here to strum and to play the notes as well. And obviously Kyle obviously couldn't hold the guitar, so instead of saying, you know, I can't, I can't, like, do this, he basically found out a way for him to move both hands on the guitar at the same time and play. My very first impression of him was kind of like, don't look at me as though this is all I am or don't take it that seriously because I don't. It was part of his life. But again, it was part of his life. It was not his life. I think I saw the very first time he did stand up as the gruesome twosome. His very first joke and his very first night of stand up was about his dystrophy and about I forget the punchline, but something about I'm one of Jerry's kids. And not only did the joke bomb, but you could feel the tension and the discomfort and the disquiet in the audience that night with that joke. And that's Kyle. That's perfect Kyle. It was around this time in Kyle's life that he first experienced true love. That love horror movies. Although his introduction to them was a little unorthodox, Kyle's love for the horror genre was immediately apparent. My cousin Robbie got me into him when I was younger, locked me in, my, uh, in his room, made me listen to A Nightmare on My Street by Will Smith and Jazzy Jeff. Yes, that used to scare me. Uh, I, I, I have to say it was a, right around when The Lost Boys came out, late 80s, 88, 89 maybe. Um, a mutual friend of Kyle and ours, Tommy, his brother had a poster of The Lost Boys, the theatrical movie poster on the wall. And I'd always go in and see it and I'd look at it and I, it just, I don't know, something about it intrigued me and I'm not sure when vampires really I don't, know, I don't want to say they became like a central force in my life because that sounds kind of creepy, but they really intrigued me and interested me. When that movie came along, I asked his brother about it, he gave me a brief synopsis, and I was hooked. I tried to explain all of my emotions to those around me, and no one quite got it except Kyle. Kyle, and um, he was always a little bit more mature for his age, I'd say, and I think it was partly to do with the fact that he had to deal with a lot of real life stuff early on. And um, so I, his parents actually allowed him to watch it not too soon after. I told him about it in spite of the age gap and, and, um, and he was hooked too. And, and we watched it a few times together. I, I know I can recite every line verbatim and I'm pretty sure Kyle could too because we've had discussions about it. And uh, you know, from there on it went to uh, movies really became, horror movies specifically, really became a uh, a central, uh, really, theme in our relationship. I'm not a big horror movie person, and he knows that I do much better with a book. We liked, you know, Stephen King, Dean Koontz, John Saul, so all those horror. Did I see horror movies with them? Yes, I did. Did I like them? No, I didn't. He would basically have, you know, a stack of movies for me to, to catch up on. You know, he's, have you seen this? No, no, bro, I haven't seen that. Have you seen this? You know, and it was so, he told me to see so many movies that I couldn't even keep track of all the titles, you know what I mean? He just loved all the gory things, and I feel like maybe it's because he couldn't get out of the chair that he could live those kind of moments through the killers and just, you know. I was so lame, and he finally broke it down and 
he made me watch a bunch of horror movies and he got me he basically got me into the genre above anything else we would just sit and talk about those movies watch those movies constantly like especially on halloween that was a big tradition we would get together and just watch like horror movie after horror movie and just have like the most fun and we would even watch some really bad horror movies as well like puppet master versus demonic toys and just you know the seed of chucky like you name it we would watch it even if it was just like awful he had you know, third special edition director cuts of every movie. I was like, Kyle, you have seven copies of Evil Dead. I mean, you really need seven copies? Yeah, of course. This one has one extra minute that the director decided not to cut out. We loved the genre that much that it didn't matter what it was. If it was horror, or we were going to watch it, talk about it, dissect it, review it, post about it, and just have like, so much fun doing it. Kyle's life was horror. And his love of horror films, as well as his love of movies in general, led to him getting a job as a teenager at Showcase Cinema in Warwick. This was an ideal job for Kyle, because not only did he love movies, but he loved to talk. And boy, did he ever. So he would many times have lines going back 20 people just waiting to talk to him, not just waiting to get into the movie. So that was another positive thing about that job for Kyle. It just was a perfect, perfect job for him being uh, able to see the movies all the time and engage with people and, and make some friends. The first time I met Kyle was at the Showcase Cinemas. He was an usher, I was an usher, and um, we were uh, stationed together to rip tickets. And uh, we just hit it off. We just started talking about every single movie that was playing in the theater, just dissecting it and either making fun of it or, you know, trashing it. And just, uh, we just had so much of a like for movies. It got to the point where we would, we would disregard the people with their tickets and we would just start talking and having fun for ourselves and uh, we just had a blast working there. I think the very first time I saw him, he was he was ripping tickets. Uh, of course, he, you know, he, he did his best, but he, he had some difficulty. And um, sometimes if there were a seven o'clock movie or a popular movie, there would be like a little bit of line that would form. And um, you know, he didn't care. That's the first time I remember. I was like, who the hell is that? And why doesn't he care? <laughs> I remember just going, being in the showcase, riding on the back of the wheelchair and me and him just rolling through, just going on a tour of the whole showcase and just having like a blast in the time of our lives. And he never let his disability get him down. He would always use it to his advantage actually. And just, you know, uh, it, it was like it was never even there. What most sticks in my mind about working with him was, was our, the breaks we took together. Because we had a really cool boss that would let me go on break with him, and we always we had a little racket going, you know what I mean? Where <laughs> we we go get our food, we get our like buffalo tenders and drinks and stuff. Then we go punch out, you know. So our our whole break is longer than it's supposed to be. I think it was one time he was busting my chops. I said, "All right, man, I'll get you." Right. So we always got buffalo tenders. So I dragged. The, I'd say, "Watch this, man." I dragged the buffalo tender and the buffalo sauce, you know. And he'd, he's just looking at me like, "Oh no," you know. Uh, right? So I gave him the buffalo tender, and he's like, uh, and he bite into it, and it was just so hot. And and we did that. I think we got we were eating buffalo tenders straight up for like. You know what I mean? Years straight. <laughs> Every Saturday our dinner was buffalo tenders, you know? <laughs> and that was fun. We had a, just a lot of great conversations on break talking about everything, you know? It seemed like every day was the same. The, the nights he worked were definitely better. He worked at Showcase for nearly seven years. And while there, he formed many friendships and special bonds that he treasured long after he left. Um, so I bought my ticket and I was, you know, waiting in line to have my ticket torn. And the person, you know, tearing tickets that day was Kyle. He told me the theater was still being cleaned, so I was stood next to him waiting and he just started, he struck up a conversation with me. Just with this ease that Kyle always had about him. And, you know, it's funny because, you know, I saw him that one time and then months went by and I didn't really think anything of it. And then I was in a classroom at Redown College and... There was Kyle, he rolled right in, and it was like, yeah, I recognized him, and at first I don't think he recognized me, and then I brought it up, and he was like, oh yeah. Um, and like from then on, we were just great friends. Already a student of film, Kyle decided to take his love to the next level, and decided to pursue a film studies degree at Rhode Island College. We both ended up 
going to Rick and I don't think we ever really discussed tech totally like, oh, we're gonna um, go into film together or whatever, but it definitely kind of just happened that way that Rick had a film program and we both got accepted and we both wanted to go that way and film was awesome. I mean, as much as it, I didn't do a lot of work in there. <laughs> I watched a lot of cool movies and being able to hang out with him because we were pretty much in every class together. I think there was maybe two two classes in four years that we weren't really together in terms of film. So just being able to hang out with him and talk movies and do all that stuff, um, it was fun. It was a good time. You know, Kyle was one of this first generation of my students, right? I came to Rick in 2006. The fall of 2006 is when I started, which seems so long ago and yet like yesterday, actually. But and but he was one of the first students I had with you all, and he was very vocal in class, which I liked. You all were so good in terms of talking about stuff, and Kyle was someone who you'd always count on to complain about something if he didn't like it, right? And like, I didn't like this movie because of such and such, or, or whatever, and, and but it was always fun. Like, so it wasn't, you know, he always, he always had a, like, if he was complaining about, about a film, I'm try, I should remember what film he would have complained about, I don't know. Probably Eisenstein, something Eisenstein, who knows? But uh, he'd be funny about it. Right? Professors would show movies that we certainly didn't care for, and Kyle would talk my ear off throughout the movie. You know, oh my God, this sucks, and he would criticize it. You know, like only like only he could. And I remember <laughs> a couple times a professor would hear us, and we, they would give us a good shushing. You know, and most of the time I would get the shushing, and it wasn't even me who was talking; it was Kyle. And I was just listening and trying to placate him, but Kyle didn't care, you know. I mean, Kyle was a great student, regardless of that. It was just really funny. Kyle used profanity on my, on my evaluations, like student evaluations. And so Kyle had very distinctive handwriting, so I knew it was him. And he used the F word, you know, and my colleagues, like, <laughs> looked at this kind of stuff. I mean, it was entirely complimentary, which, surprisingly, for, for profanity, but, um... But it was, but that was that was him. It was this kind of brash, good-natured fun that's kind of in your face. And um, and I have to say, I was really grateful that we didn't have to. I didn't have to submit uh, student evaluations for my tenure file <laughs> because you know, like he took four classes with me. He always used like the F word in his in his uh, emails. Around uh, 2007, a couple friends and I we started the Ocean State Film Festival. It was a student-run short film festival for students by students. Um, to really try to get the, the film program noticed. Um, and he was one of this, Kyle was one of the, its very first supporters. I remember he was at the uh, first festival, and then fast forward a year later, and he was gracious enough to be a judge on it. And I remember feeling very thankful that he would be on the panel with us. You know, we all went out to dinner, uh, after the festival that night, and he really just would not stop talking about movies and horror movies. Maybe I taught horror because of Kyle, right? And I gave, I gave a talk on campus where I, where I said, those who can't, like myself, watch horror, teach it, right? So that was my, my excuse for that. Um, God, there's so many uh, memories that, you know, that I, I think about. I think about HM 193 and our little corner. That was a group of about seven or eight of us would always sit in and we sat in for the next for about two and a half years i always remember where he sat because he had to sit in a particular spot and so that was always kyle's spot and so nowadays um it's still where students with disabilities are seated, they're seated in that particular area and i always think of it as kyle's spot still right so it's yeah and so why not make it kyle's room he doesn't get just one desk right one table he should have the whole room why not for sure after graduating cum laude from Rhode Island College, Kyle needed a new challenge. He wanted to take what he had learned and break into the field that he fell in love with all those years ago. The older he got, he got a better appreciation that, you know, this was art. This was true art. So what became entertaining for him, for him when he was very young, that transformed and morphed into, wow, this is really cool. I really like this. I think this is something I want to do. Amassing a close-knit group of fellow film students, Kyle formed an independent film company. Morbidly Amusing was born. Yeah, it was a really special time for me. Um, 
because of when I did get fired from the showcase, I didn't see Kyle for a few years, and that was a really tough point in my life. Like I was probably hit rock bottom. I didn't really have any friends and wasn't really doing anything, and I was just like, oh, I'm gonna go back to school. Then I went back to Rhode Island College, and I remember one of my first days back, I was walking through uh, Donovan Dining Center, and I saw Kyle sitting there eating, and immediately we just kind of like made eye contact, and we came over to him and we just started talking it was just like no time passed at all and and then he had told me about I'm um, starting a movie company and he asked me if I wanted to be a part of it and I was just like yeah definitely I had nothing going on I was like, we had our first meeting over at um, his father's office in a, a, an office space they weren't using at the time and I, I found myself really really excited you know it was we were talking about films and things we could do instead of talking about other people's films and it was on a small scale, sure. I mean, we we had limited resources, but it was exciting. And I remember leaving there, thinking that you know, this like this is the beginning. And I was really, really thankful for Kyle for wanting to include me in it and seeing, you know, uh, some of that love that he had for film in me. Morbidly amusing, a name that combined Kyle's sense of humor and his love of horror represented everything that Kyle had embodied. With the help of Andrew Cate, Mark Espinola, Ross Tweedy, and Kenny Nardoza, Kyle began to see results. Not only was he crafting his own material, but he was also forming his own film community. One of the main memories of our morbidly amusing days was filming Alistair Apricot learns a lesson. You know, it's hard to put into words the way Kyle felt about Alistair Apricot as our first legitimate, and I use the term loosely, legitimate uh, film project. And it was sort of an homage to Charlie Chaplin and Mr. Bean, and Kyle was supposed to be the uh, villain in it. Um, and, uh, you know, I just remember some of my memories from that shoot were he was hamming it up every second he got. He's the best part of the film as he often was. You know, Kyle wasn't a professional actor at all, but he just went for it and he just, he had this acting ability that was, you know, well, I guess I'll say it, Corey Feldman-esque. And Kyle wouldn't have had it any other way. This led Kyle to other unique experiences where he would take on more responsibility. So this is filmmaking for all you fuckers out there. <laughs> this is how we do it. Casey Sorelli style bitches. <laughs> Kyle's directorial debut film was called Serial Killing for Dummies, and I still remember him bringing up the concept to me. And it's funny to think about because, you know, it was a found footage horror film, and in, in Kyle's later years, he always could not hold back his disdain for the found footage horror genre. But, you know, Kyle decided, like all great entrepreneurs, that, you know, he wasn't gonna let that disdain stop him from, you know, taking advantage of what was in, in the genre at the time. The greatest thing about killing somebody is the excitement. And you kill one or two or 20, and it wears off, you know? I'm getting bored and listless. You know, I want some fucking excitement back in my life, some notoriety. I want people to know my name, and that's why I'm here. I remember he, uh, he stuck me in a van with Brianna Conti, and he gave me a knife. I don't remember if it was real. It was probably real because it was Kyle. I'm going to assume it was a real stick knife and some lines of dialogue. And uh, we just did it and did it and did it until we did it without laughing, which with Kyle was extraordinarily difficult. Or it just got too dark and we didn't have the light. Uh, with Kyle, it, when I remember shooting, that that was the way scenes ended. They didn't. You, you it either got too dark if you were in an exterior, or you were just laughing with. Them. And, but if you could get it, if you could get through a, a, a serious Kyle take with, um, without laughing, and then the light was right, then you were, you were good, and you were on to the next one. Kyle came up with this concept, went out there, and got it done. And that's something that I admired about Kyle so much, because I didn't know that I had the capability of, get, of putting a film together and making something on my own. And I wouldn't have known that if it wasn't for, you know, morbidly amusing productions and Kyle. It was at this time in Kyle's life when he decided to take Morbidly Amusing in a new direction. A website featuring horror reviews, interviews, and video content 
that served to open a dialogue with the horror fan community. Kyle called on his childhood friend, Sean Keating, to help create morbidlyamusing.com. You know, I really think we should get a video introduction for the site, but I'm not quite sure what it should be. What's your opinion on it? Well, it should involve gore, boobs, excessive drug use. That will get people to go to the site. Maybe we should ask our uh, webmaster what he thinks about it. What do you think? Sure. I'll tell you some stuff once you pay me. You're expecting payment? We're an independent film company based out of Rhode Island. We don't have any money. Kyle really had it set out that he was going to recreate the site, make a whole new design, change his work ethic, and just really like make his site like take off and put his name out there. He would just sit there all day and just search the web for any type of horror news they were, were and then he would write an article about it and then he would review movies and it even got to the point where me and him would make some videos like the regurgitators rot got musical reviews which i still love and um and just other things in general like he would even reach out to people who would make videos for the website and he that he and there was even things that he wanted to do that unfortunately we never got accomplished like uh doing podcasts and things like that he loves to find connections with people and this was his way of connecting with far more people than any person could reach just in any given day. I remember like um, whenever someone would leave like a negative comment on anything, you'd be like, oh, you know, now I know I've made it in, in the world of the internet because people are, you know, talking bad about me on there and stuff. And I was like, all right, well, that's, that's an awesome way to look at it because he just, he, he really wanted that. He didn't, he really just wanted to have a voice. It didn't matter how people we're going to perceive it. He just wanted to have it out there. You know, toward the end of his life, he started to just really pour himself into it. And it was like, again, who does that? <laughs> I mean, what? he's just so special, seriously. Now that he's gone, uh, I'm trying to keep the site going. It's, it's not the same without Kyle, though. He would always, you know, be posting something every day, and I don't really have the ability to do that. But, you know, I just working on it still, you know, because I know that's what Kyle would want, you know, it means so much, and I, I know, and I like to think that Kyle, you know, would be proud that MorbidAmazing.com is still going, and, you know, I, I mean, I know he would be proud. As time wore on, Kyle was more and more focused on his screenwriting, cranking out various scripts. It was a brilliant creative time for Kyle, and his physical limitations in prospectively handling a camera and the production equipment never dimmed his ability to formulate a unique idea for a script. It was Kyle's unique point of view and his expansive knowledge of the horror genre that attracted filmmaker Tom DiNucci. So I saw on Facebook that he was doing this morbidly amusing uh, site and that he was reviewing a lot of horror movies and I liked his reviews, I thought they were funny. And I think I reached out to him and was like, hey man, yeah, I love to have you do a review of my movie, you know, always trying to pump my product out there. And uh, he said, sure, he, he watched it. And um, not only did he, he give me a nice review, he really, he got my movie, you know what I mean? Like he understood where I was coming from. So that kind of opened up the door for me when I found out he was doing that kind of stuff. And then sure enough, he reached out to me and said, hey, do you, you know, think you'd want to maybe read one of my scripts and take a look at it? And that's what started this whole slime book thing. You know, I, I would be over here five days a week and talk to him or on the phone with him and he'd say, I got this idea about this movie. I got this idea about this movie. And so after a while, like when he, you know, when, when he was really starting to get down the dumps, I said to him, you know what, why don't you just man up and do it. The more he wrote, the less his body cared. The less restraint he had in his body. His body, I would say to him, Kyle, they're just legs. Legs don't make a person. And I started that, I mean, we started when he, when he first went in the wheelchair. Legs don't make the person, Kyle. You make the person. It's what you think, how you feel, how you treat people, and how you respect others. That's what makes a person. He would sit there, actually lie there for hours, with the mouse typing out one letter at a time, just to complete that movie, and um, uh, you know it was it was just a a painstaking exercise for you know physically, but you know mentally he knew what he wanted. The way he talked about it, 
it made me feel like it was a pet project for him. You know, like, I'm taking everything I learned in school, everything I learned making the film so far, and, and putting it, put my all into this one, you know? Because I, I, you could tell it was just a pet concept for him, something that, that he would go forward and say, this is where I started, you know, this is, here are the hidden elements that I'm going to put in all my films. Stuff, you know, stuff like that, that great directors put in their films. That's how I kind of looked at, at Slimebuck. Late in 2013, Kyle finished the first draft of a horror script he had been working on, Slimebuck. Though Kyle's muscular dystrophy was progressing, there was no challenge too big or great for Kyle. He was determined to leave a mark on the genre that he had loved since he was just a boy. He called me one day and he's like, well, guess what? I'm like, what? He's like, you gotta tell me that you're proud of me. And I'm like, is it done? And he's like, yep, it's done. And I'm like, there you go. I'm proud of you. I love you. Good job, Mickey. I'm, I'm very proud of you. You, you. you did it. And he was, it, it, it just seemed to re-motivate him. You know, the last year and a half of his life was so focused on that and, and it got him so happy and, you know, he, he fought to the very end and, and I think it was that movie that I helped him write in that movie is what got him there. So he finally, like, he got the script together and we went back and forth and it was good, you know, I really liked it and I liked the fact that it was kind of geared a little more towards uh, a different type of audience, you know, there was like a youthful element that wasn't there in anything that I had done. It had a kid for the main character that I thought was cool, I'd never worked with kids before. And I think of a lot of the great 80s movies that I grew up with, and there's always like a young, a young boy who's like the main character that we can kind of like visualize ourselves as, you know, the, when you're a kid watching these movies. You know, a couple weeks later, he's just like, hey, Tommy, um, so you know, I'm not messing around. Like, I have a little budget together. It's not much, but I got a little money. Do you know anyone who makes creatures who could build me a creature? And I said, yeah, I know just the guy who can build you a creature. Uh, friend of mine who I've worked with many times, Ben Bornstein, um, and he's done some really, really big films. So at first I was thinking like, well, maybe this is, you know, out of Kyle's range for right now. I don't know, but, you know, at least I can put them together. And sure enough, um, it, it wasn't out of Kyle's range and he was willing to do anything it took to get this done. I, I still remember the day I came over here and Kyle was like, I have the creature, uh, you know, in my house, but don't take any pictures of it. He wanted to make sure it was top secret. He didn't want anything getting leaked out about this creature and I saw the creature and I was like really happy I saw this like you know slimy like evil demonic looking you know like evil slimer really and I was just like so happy to see that I was like this is Kyle Kyle like essentially it kind of reminded me of Kyle and you know after reading the script as well I was like I really think Kyle identified with slime buck and uh, to me that was like really cool I know that he held that movie really close to him and really wanted to make sure that was going to be something uh, for everybody to see. This past fall, a group of local filmmakers, led by Tom Danucci, came together to make Kyle's last script, Slimebuck, a reality. Kyle uh, shot me a message very close uh, towards the end when we were putting this all together, and he basically said, you know, Tommy, I'm very serious about this. I want to make a movie at the level of a major, major motion picture. I want to do it right. I want to have actors. I want to have a whole crew. Um, you know, will you help me get that going? You know, I said, of course. You know, like, of course we will. And, and Vin, Kyle's dad, got behind it so hard, and Kyle's mom and that, and they supported it so much. Um, and it was really great for me on the final day when we wrapped. You know, because Vin went through a lot for this movie, and so did Annette, but, you know, they gave us their home for a whole week. We had 30 people here. We totally destroyed their kitchen temporarily, which you'll, you'll figure that out when you watch the movie. Um, it was a long week for them, and plus they were dealing with kind of, you know, a lot of emotional weight of, uh, you know, having this in their hands. You know, this is a big thing. Uh, and it was great for me when we wrapped the final night. I took my phone out. And I read that text of Vin from Kyle that said, this is what I want, you know, can you help me do that? And then I was able to say, that's exactly what we just did. You know, like, you gave Kyle exactly what he wanted, and that's, that's how he wanted it. We shot that movie like it was a feature film. We had some great, talented people behind the camera. We had some 
real, real stars in front of the camera, and uh, you know, we did what Kyle would have wanted, and that's you know, that's that's uh, one of the reasons why I'm so happy about this movie. On April seventh, two thousand fourteen. Kyle passed away, leaving a lasting impact as a filmmaker, a friend, and a beloved son. Words cannot express how he has changed all of our lives, but his memory and the times we all shared with him will no doubt live on forever. What is Kyle's legacy? I think his legacy is, it, it, it might sound vague, but I think it's this, it's the documentary, it's his movie, it's his website. I mean. It's the group of people that he got together that, in all honesty, probably never would have crossed paths if it wasn't for Kyle. When he would see somebody else in, in, a, in, in a wheelchair, he'd say, see, look at that person. They give me a bad name. It looks like they're crying. They're giving me a bad name. <laughs> and he's like, why can't they just be happy? And I was like, well, you know, that's what it is, guys. Some people can't be as happy as you. I don't know how he did it. I really don't. But I, I, I think it's just his strength as, as, as a person. It, it was unbelievable. It, you would relate someone with his disabilities to be in a homebody, right? But we would go out to bars, we would go out to eat. He would call me up, and I was too homebody to go out with him. You know, hey, bro, we're down at this bar. Uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you want to come down here? And it's really cool. I'm like, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm busy. You know what I mean? It was just he, nothing could hold him back. I think he was a great kid. I think he had great friends. I think he. Annette and Vinnie made sure he every aspect of life he touched upon. He did everything that he was able to do. And I just think they were fabulous parents and they were so lucky to have him. I just think their life was so enriched by him and they were so enriched by each other. I think his legacy to us is just to continue living life to its fullest, to keep friends and family close and to always be there for one another. He sort of clarified to me what strength was and what tenacity was and what sacrifice was and what, I think all of that, all of that. I mean, he was a remarkable human being, absolutely remarkable. Had more balls than a pool table. He kind of showed me what it was like to be a man even though he was younger than me. Um, he was just, uh, he's, a, he's, he's Kyle. I think everybody he touched, he definitely made an impression. I'm sure everyone can speak to this, loving movies, not as much as Kyle did, of course, but like Kyle did and having loved Kyle, it's very hard to see something now and not think, what, what Kyle thought of that? And I think part of, I hope the way I see movies in the world is, is the way Kyle did. He was just an inspirational kid. I mean, a 30-year-old kid. In my mind, he never grew up. Uh, in my mind, he'd always be that little little boy. But uh, he was a man. He was a 30-year-old man who outlived every prediction of how long he he would he would live. He he, and I think part of that had to do with his positive nature and his um, attitude toward, this is not going to defeat me. I'm going to do what I want to do in life. Kyle went on trips. Kyle was, you know, I would see him out and about all of the time. Like, he never let anything get in the way of what he wanted to do. And then eventually, when he, you know, couldn't leave the house anymore, just any time I would come here, the amount of friends he had. I mean, it just showed the type of person that he was and that if he couldn't go out, people were going to go out of their way to spend time with him. So in, in his high school yearbook, um, Kyle's quote was, do or do not, there is no try. And that is a quote from Yoda. And what I think is that Kyle actually did that. He did, he did it. That he grew to be a man that succeeded in everything he wanted. In 30 short years without the ability to move much of his body, but he used his mind to the fullest possible extent that he could. One night, my husband, Kyle, and my nephew, Nathan, we went to a Paw Sox game together. Well, it happened to be disability night at the Paw Sox, which opened up a floodgate for Kyle and Nathan. He 
pile. I could hear them. They sat in the handicap section behind us and they kept going. Look at all these gimps. I can't believe we're here on gimp night. Of all nights to be here. And I'm like, I kept turning around going, shh, shh. Just, I mean, like, look, we're sitting right next to all, look at all these people. All, and I'm just like, I said, oh my God. I said, it's quiet, please quiet. But again, to chuckle at, you know, him being disabled and yet, you know, him calling himself a gimp, but just yeah, things like that. Kyle's legacy is, you know, the people he loved and those who loved him. And, you know, I think Slimebuck is, you know, going to be that lasting memory of Kyle. You know, the last script he wrote was made into a horror short that was filmed at his house where we all spent so many good times with him. And I think that, you know, is important because not only is it a film that is based on a script that Kyle wrote himself, but it takes place, you know, at this location where all of us spent uh, some of the greatest memories of our lives with Kyle. And that is his legacy. I think it's morbidly amusing. I, I really, really do. Um, and I also think it's it's the people that have kept Morbidly Amusing going. And, I, and I, I say that because it shows how much of a uniter Kyle really was and how much potential he would see in people. I truly believe he saw what what every individual could do uh, before they knew it themselves. He was just so selfless. He would always just try to make sure that everybody was having a good time. And uh, even if he was in a severe amount of pain, he would still want you to come over and you know do something with him and hang out and he would just make he would make your day even though he was not having the best day and uh, there, there are so many great times um, so many great memories that are associated with Kyle Sorelli and uh, you know um, I'll always remember him I'll always remember each and every one of them it sounds goofy but I think every time I'm on a movie set for the rest of my life like if things get hot I'll be like all right Kyle would just calm down here, you know. So he's he's always making movies with me from now on, you know. I can honestly say he left nothing on the table. He didn't. I know that if you know he's up there looking down, he has no regrets because there is nothing that he could have done better. There's nothing that he could have changed. There's nothing that he could ever say. God, I wish I went a little bit farther, right? Like he did it all. He got it done. He had the most amazing group of friends. He brought together people from all walks of life that have now formed this amazing bond. And I'm sure that, you know, the folks that he has, has that he's brought together will be together for life. You know, I'm glad that I now have those friends, um, you know, even after he's gone. And, and, and I miss him a lot. You know, the day he was born was the best day in my life. And as much as the day that he left and he died was the worst. But in between, oh God, what a roller coaster. It was great, it was high, it was low, it was medium. It was, I would do it all over again in a heartbeat. It was awesome. He taught me things and it was an honor and it was a privilege and you know, he's, he's here. As old parents do, you want to take your son or daughter on a journey. But as I said uh, many times, Kyle actually took myself and his mom on a journey. And he's still taking us on a journey. And there's not that many people in this world that uh, that, that, that can happen for or to or be. Or, so we're, we're just, we were just very fortunate to uh, to have Kyle with us for, for, for as long as we did and, uh, and, and we're still realizing his, uh, his dreams and, uh, and his legacy will, will, will carry on.
And remember, this is Dr. Morbid signing off. May all your nights be bloody and filled with death.